some jurisdictions have decided to allow transit to keep masking for longer periods of time. You haven't done that here. What's the guidance to BC Transit and TransLink? What do you say to those who are immunocompromised, at highest risk, who are now going to be worried just to walk into a grocery store or to complete the essentials of their life, considering that others around them may not be wearing their masks? Yeah, you know, I know that this is going to be a challenging time for for people who are feeling very much at risk and have taken those precautions over this last two years. Just to say that we can look at what's happening in terms of transmission across our communities, and as that goes down, we're all a little safer. And those environments where we were requiring to have multiple different layers of protection, we no longer need all of those layers to be mandated all of the time. So yes, I'll continue to wear my mask if I'm on public transit, and I would encourage others to do so too. We know it protects us, but it's also a sign of respect and protect for other protection for others. But we also need to be clear that things like grocery stores are not the highest risk environments when we go in them. So it's a matter of time and space and how close we are to people. So let's continue to be respectful. Recognize that some people will need to continue to wear masks and it will be important for them. And that we should keep a respectful distance for people um, so that we're not crowding them in places like grocery stores and other essential places. But I think we're in a good place now. It's not out of the woods by all means and I would encourage people to assess their own risk and the, the risk of those around them as we go through this next few weeks and we hopefully will continue to see the risk go away. The other part I think that's really important vaccination of so many people and the immunity that we have in our community now means that that risk is down quite a lot. So um, it's going to take some time to build that confidence again to go out to those places and I encourage people to take your own time and wear your own mask as long as you feel comfortable doing that. Richard, do you have a follow-up? Just on that briefly, I'm trying to understand if something like transit or BC ferries can put in a mask mandate still. Yes, absolutely. Um, workplaces, some places may uh, may feel that it's important for their workers to be um, protected for various reasons and they can uh, require mask wearing. They can require uh, the vaccine card in certain settings but they need to do their own diligence about what that means and how that will impact uh, their workplace. The next question comes from Justine Hunter, Globe and Mail. Hi, thank you. Um, Dr. Henry, I understand that you've changed the plan, but I'm just not clear and I'm hoping you can spell this out for me. Have you dropped the requirement for all regulated healthcare professionals to be vaccinated in order to work in BC? Uh, no, not entirely. What we've done is taken a look at the, the multiple different colleges and different regulated health professionals and we're taking a, a more nuanced risk-based approach. For some, that will mean that you must be vaccinated to practice in certain settings, um, but we're doing that on a more uh, tailored basis to each of the regulated health professions and in a stepwise way. And we have the advantage right now of being in a place where we can take the time to work through it individually with the colleges and with individual registrants in each college. And as I mentioned, I wanted to ensure that we had options available. And just to be clear, these options like Novavax and the uh, Medicago, the protein subunit vaccines, are available for other workers who are in, uh, uh, um, who have uh, stepped away from work. So other healthcare workers uh, in our public system who are ready to be vaccinated, I encourage you to call the number and, and uh, book a dose of Novavax. It should be in in the next few weeks. Um, I will commit to the one part that uh, we have been working with the colleges on is ensuring that there is a, a way uh, for individual patients or clients to be informed and to have informed consent about uh, their services that are being provided to them. Justine, do you have a follow-up? I do, thank you. Dr. Henry, again to you, you've talked throughout the pandemic about using science and data to guide public health decisions. I'm wondering uh, your thoughts on one of the province's chief medical officers citing as evidence uh, to guide these decisions a paper that argues harms of punitive public health strategies may outweigh the benefits. 
Yeah, so um, that uh, that paper, as you know, is a, is an opinion piece that was uh, published on a social sciences uh, network, and it is something that reminds us that there are consequences to the measures that we put in place, and it is really important to take those into account. Uh, we have always tried to balance the risks and benefits of each measure that we've put in place and to do it in a way that's thoughtful. And I think we've done that in BC. From very early on, I've been, uh, I've, we have a group that has been working on measuring the unintended consequences. We've done things like uh, the, the, the COVID speak survey to help understand the impacts both of the measures that we put in place to manage COVID and the, the effects of the virus and the pandemic itself. So those are very important considerations. And that's why we have limited uh, where we have the BC vaccine card in effect, for example, where we've limited the mandates and the orders to try and put the least restrictive means in place as much as possible. And where we've had vaccine mandates focusing on those highest risk settings like healthcare settings. So I think it is, um, in my opinion, a slightly biased opinion uh, piece, but those are all very important considerations that we have looked at and we need to continue to monitor and to take into account as we put in or remove the restrictions that we've seen in place here. Next question comes from Rob Shaw, Czech News. Oh, hi. Um, just. Um I just wanted, Dr. Henry, if you could compare where we were June 29th of last year when we lift masks uh, the first time to where we are now. We had a lower vaccination rate. I think it was 32% double dose. We're at 91% now. We had 29 cases that day back then. We're at 270 something now. Um, you've mentioned the higher vaccination rate, but what makes it different those two times given that we had to bring masks back a few weeks later uh, in August versus where we are now when we lift them this time. Yeah, I think the philosophy of where we are, the trajectory is the same in that you use uh, the least amount of tools that are needed um, by a mandate, so by an order um, at the times when you can. So as cases were coming down, vaccination rates were high, um, the viruses, strains that we were dealing with at the time were uh, the vaccination, the two doses was um, very protective for people and we saw cases come down and, and you know we were optimistic that that might be uh, the the point where we would no longer need to put measures in place um, that required things like masking and other uh, things that we've put in place. And what happened was we were faced with yet another strain, another variant of concern that caused rapidly increasing cases. So all of those tools became important again. And that's where the importance of the BC vaccine card came into play, making sure that we did have vaccine available. And as you remember at that time, younger children were not yet eligible for vaccination, so under 17, making sure that people did get their second dose, um, boosting up the rates in, uh, in those younger age groups where it was still lagging. So it was important. Um, and as we saw the change in the virus and the patterns of transmission and who was getting sick, we needed to add additional tools. So we're at a place now where we have a much higher level of community immunity, um, primarily from vaccination and a little bit from people who've been uh, um, uh, had recent infections. And we're seeing that that means cases are decreasing and the cases that are occurring are mostly milder. And so we need a new set of tools to help us get through this period and we no longer need to have all of the measures all of the time by, by way of an order. So I think in some ways we're in a very similar situation. If we start to see, uh, you know, this is one of the things that we've been working through with uh, colleagues around the world, um, you know, what's going to happen next? We think that there's very likely to continue to be strong protection from our cell mediated immunity against this virus, no matter how much it mutates in its spike protein, for example. So, but that means that we may see with similar things to what we saw with Omicron, where infectiousness, because uh, the virus is trying to find ways to, to infect more people. So, there may be changes that mean that we'll have to go back to having mask wearing in certain situations or capacity limits in certain situations. But I think we're in a good place right now uh, where we don't need that for this period of time. 
Rob, do you have a follow-up? Sure, I guess just to follow uh, up what you just said there, there might be situations where we bring back some tools like masks or capacity limits. Does, could you foresee the vaccine card being brought back if things uh, change? And, and also, do you expect a jump in cases or hospitalization or ICU rates um, in the short term as these masks come off? And if so, as we're watching these, what's kind of an acceptable or, or understood to be kind of results of, of maybe this that we shouldn't panic about if we see it? Yeah, we, we may see a, a slight increase in cases, but I don't expect to see a jump in you know, some of the modeling that helps us understand that. Uh, the potential impacts shows that it, it's unlikely. We may see a slight increase or a leveling off or you know, a decrease in the decrease, um, but it's unlikely that we're going to see a spike right now. Um, because of the high level of immunity that we have. Um, that's why I'm, I'm looking really towards, uh, towards the fall in our respiratory season, because that's where the higher risk potential is. And there may be other things that we'll need to put in place. So it'll depend, you know, I talked about an optimistic scenario is a, a virus that is not that much more, uh, a strain that's not that much more transmissible and it doesn't cause more severe disease. But a pessimistic model might be a, a virus strain that is uh, able to evade immunity and cause more severe disease in which case we may have to bring back some of those uh, additional measures or we may have to have a, a, a new vaccine program. You know, I suspect we may need a targeted vaccine program depending on who's getting infected. So it may be an, a, an additional dose for um, our elders, seniors, people in long-term care. Uh, so those are the things that we don't yet know um, but that we need to have uh, measures in place to be able to monitor for and to have those tools that we all now know how to use and uh, be prepared to, to bring them back if we need to. Next question, Binder Sajjan, CTV. Hello there. Um, I'm just wondering, I heard you speak about the high level of vaccina vaccination here in BC and uh, I'm sure other people are wondering as well, uh, why are we waiting four weeks to remove the vaccine passport when we see other provinces have already removed it or are removing it weeks sooner. Yeah, so uh, it's been used in different ways in different provinces. So we had a very limited uh, areas where our, the, the BC vaccine card was being used in those highest risk settings. And most of those settings, so if we think about a bar, a restaurant, uh, um, a, a nightclub, an event, are settings where at least some of the time we don't wear masks and so we need to mitigate the risk of transmission in those settings while we still have reasonably high transmission in our communities right now. So we are taking this in a stepwise and measured way so that as people get used to being out and about without masks on in some settings, um, we still have the confidence to go to some of these higher risk indoor settings as well. So it is a, a transition period where we're going to be watching carefully to make sure we're not seeing the spike in cases and to uh, ensure that we uh, do this in a way that supports people who are feeling still very vulnerable at this point in time. Binder, do you have a follow-up? I do, and I know you spoke about this a couple of times, but I'm just wondering for the healthcare workers who were terminated because they were subject to a mandate and didn't get vaccinated, uh, does that mandate still apply to them? And also, uh, the tone of this press conference seems to be one of a farewell for now. Uh, what do you expect in terms of updates uh, for the public going forward? I'm, I'm going to run away for a long time. No, uh, the, uh, uh, in, in terms of the, the healthcare worker mandate, yes, that remains in effect. It's really important, and I, I mentioned this, that we have that baseline level of immunity, and we've seen how important immunization in our healthcare sector is. So what we are working on in, uh, with uh, the ministry and with our, um, uh, the colleges and, and the healthcare professions and the health authorities is an ongoing policy that includes COVID immunization but other immunizations that are important for us in terms of protecting healthcare resources so our health um, ourselves as well as uh, making sure that we're doing everything we can to prevent transmission of, of uh, communicable diseases, vaccine preventable diseases in our healthcare system. Uh, 
In terms of what we're doing, uh, yes, we're not going to have an official media briefing for the next couple of weeks, but we will before uh, to make sure that we have an update before a April 8th uh, to give people uh, so that we are monitoring what we're doing. We'll be continuing with our daily uh, uh, issues briefs with the, the basic information in the dashboard uh, for the next few weeks up until April and then we'll be transitioning to a weekly surveillance report after that. Uh, and just to express um, uh, my appreciation, as you know, uh, across the province uh, when the vac vaccination, uh, proof of vaccination requirement was in place in the public health care system, that's 180,000 workers, including all those workers in long-term care. Uh, our health care workers stepped up in an exceptional way. It ended up being about 99 percent of workers getting vaccinated. And uh, I, um, it's my uh, belief, uh, strong belief, that everyone uh, should get vaccinated. There's some new opportunities, and Novavax produces, uh, uh, provides a new opportunity now. I would note that you're about 30 times likely, 30 times more likely to be in critical care if you're unvaccinated in BC today with all of this. And uh, it is uh, absolutely, I think, uh, necessary for people who, who are ready for their booster dose to get their booster dose. If you're interested in Novavax, that's 1-833-838-2323. We'll, you can go on the list and we'll contact you and make arrangements for that. And if you're uh, a parent of a child 5 to 11, there are opportunities all over BC for your child to be vaccinated as well. This is a crucial part of our response in terms of our briefings. Yes, this will be the last in what you call uh, regular briefings, but um, as Dr. Henry has said, I, I would expect in the in the week of March 31st, you'll be seeing uh, uh, seeing uh, Dr. Henry and myself again from Dr. Henry, probably some modeling to show where we are in the pandemic at that point, and uh, we'll continue, of course, to be available on a regular basis to respond to questions about this and and many other subjects. Next question comes from Lisa Cordasco, Vancouver Sun. Why have you decided that masks are no longer needed in schools or won't be soon uh, when most children under the age of 11 are not fully vaccinated? And um, along with that, can you expand on what you are contemplating regarding the K-12 and child care guidelines? Uh, for yeah, so uh, we, uh, we know that schools um, are very um, structured environment which the same uh, children that go in and out in the classrooms and uh, in the child care settings um, similar things so we know that as risk goes down in the community that's reflected in risk in the structured uh, lower Environments in schools, so it absolutely will will be a mask positive environment, and those who continue to want to wear masks and are comfortable doing that will be supported to do that, uh, both staff and students. But it will no longer be a mandate in classrooms, in particular, and in other parts of the of the school. So uh, the education, uh, we've been working with our education partners to revise those guidelines. Um, they'll also include things around there's been limits on uh, people who can come in and out of the school on some of the additional measures we put in place uh, for Omicron around staggering of breaks and things like that that will no longer be needed when we get to that point uh, at the end of, of spring break and it's a time of transition to help support children to getting back to a more um, a, a next normal, I'm hearing it called, uh, but a more um, normal environment to support them in the development and growth and all of the other important things um, around the schools um, that support uh, young children in particular. So it is trying to balance what's needed um, to protect kids and mitigate those risks and ensure that we can uh, allow them to get the most out of uh, the school environment. Lisa, do you have a follow-up? Yes, thank you. Um, going forward, the surveillance program will be relying on the Sentinel program, uh, which will pick up the sickest of people, um, and the wastewater, which you know captures the lower mainland only. But meanwhile, in the interior and northern health cases remain to be raging. Um, so, uh, wondering then, you know, we're not going to be doing surveillance through PCR testing of anyone who has COVID symptoms. So. I'm wondering 
what assurances you can give to British Columbians who might not be confident that you will be able to pick up early warning signals. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, those are some of the things that re we report, but there are many other surveillance streams that we watch uh, uh, on a daily basis and a weekly basis to help us understand what's going on in different communities around the province. So it's, uh, yeah, I've likened it in, in many ways to, to uh, a puzzle where there's different pieces that come from different places. So if we see a signal in one thing, so wastewater is up for one reason, and uh, uh, you know, we've done some in uh, uh, a university residence and we saw a, a, a spike and then we say okay well what's happening why do we see a spike in this so there's a whole number of different places that we watch so we look at outbreaks in long-term care we look at what's happening in our hospitals we have testing programs for workers in certain situations that we uh, can another and PCR testing will continue it'll continue we have sentinel physician testing um, right now we've been using a lot of the testing centers, but that will transition as we would for any respiratory illness. So if you're sick enough to need medical care, test from your physician and that will tell whether it's, uh, we, we have a, a, a multiplex array testing that uh, emergency departments, it's done in uh, uh, in uh, healthcare set, um, in um, your physician's office, for example, that tests for influenza and RSV and COVID. So those are the things that we have in place for other respiratory illnesses that will continue uh, to allow us to, uh, to monitor in a systematic way what we're seeing uh, for, for SARS-CoV-2 as well. So I would encourage you to look at, for example, our influenza surveillance report that comes out weekly. Those are some of the measures that we will integrate uh, COVID surveillance into. Next question comes from Cole Schisler, Black Press. Uh, hi there. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, you said that this will be an uncomfortable time for folks who are susceptible to severe outcomes to COVID. But for people at high risk, it's not a matter of comfort for them. It's a matter of life and death. Uh, with restrictions being lifted, what what is in place to protect people at high risk and what will the province do to support those people? Yeah, so we need to recognize that the things that are in place that are making it less risky for all of us are vaccination. And that the fact that we've all been vaccinated for ourselves protects others too. So that's the really big one. And that's why we're in this place that we're in. We have that level of immunity. But we also know that people who are going through cancer treatments, people who have transplants, they have always had to take additional protections to ensure that they're not exposed to respiratory illnesses and to other infectious diseases because they know their immune systems are not as strong. So we will continue to be able to provide them the support that they need. And this is what you know we're trying to say today that it is important for us to all recognize that we don't know everybody's story and there's a reason why somebody may be wearing a mask there's a reason why somebody may be asking us to wear a mask if we're coming to visit them or to have a test before we go into long-term care because those are things that help us um, support those people whose immune systems no matter how many vaccines they have are not going to be able to fully protect them and they may be more at risks. So it is about uh, us all recognizing that those people are part of our social networks, part of our families, part of our workplaces, and that the measures that we're taking are respectful and supportive to make sure that they're protected as well. Cole, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, with you know more people dropping the mask with the vaccine card requirement going away, hopefully COVID doesn't go back up. Uh, but if it does, uh, are we going to see increased testing to detect long COVID in people? And is the province going to, or does the province have a plan to step up supports for people who are suffering from long COVID? Yeah, long COVID is one of those things that is related to infections. We also know that some of the key measures that help prevent long COVID 
our vaccination. Your risk is dramatically decreased if you're immunized and you happen to have a breakthrough infection. So we, there's also many things we don't yet know about long-term effects of COVID, and some of them we're, we're starting to learn um, about the effects on the brain, about the effects on uh, um, other uh, parts of our, our, our systems over time. And those will continue. There will continue to be uh, supports in place. We have, as you know, a, a clinic, uh, four clinics, and uh, uh, it's a hub and spoke model to support people getting uh, assessed through their family physician or through their local community clinic, and they can uh, get into that. But I think we also need to, I'm, I'm not making a whole lot of sense, but yes, uh, those are important considerations. Really important considerations, and globally, we're trying to understand the longer term impacts, some of which we won't know for years from now. I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah. Absolutely, and I, ju I just add to this, and this is, you know, um, I think uh, we've seen in uh, recent weeks with the um, um, invasion of Ukraine how issues and terrible actions by uh, people, in this case the Russian president, affect people all around the world. With respect to COVID-19, it's important to remember, and Dr. Henry has made this point repeatedly and it's a lie, that we continue to have to work to vaccinate people throughout the world, around the world, in every part of the world. I mean, we have to learn, surely, a fundamental lesson of the COVID-19 pandemic in our modern world is that events that happen and viruses that emerge somewhere well across the world can affect us here. We refer to variants uh, sometimes by the origin where, where they were discovered. It's not where they started, but where they were discovered, such as, um, uh, such as uh, the Omicron variant of concern itself, which was discovered by outstanding scientists in South Africa. But we have an obligation as a world to uh, not just fully vaccinate ourselves in BC, and we've got to continue to do that, and the effort continues to do that. And I think it's a very strong one here. And the fact that we're getting on to 94% of adults that are vaccinated is pretty impressive in BC. But we have to see that happen throughout the world because that is part of the response to, in this period, uh, to both the Omicron variant of concern and the future of COVID 19. So it, it matters in BC um, that there is a vaccination in South Africa, and it matters uh, and it matters in BC that there's vaccination in all countries in the world, and we have to uh, continue to support those measures at a national and international level to ensure that everyone has the right that everyone in BC has had to a, f a free, available uh, v vaccine that makes them safer. Just one other comment about, you know, it's it, from the very beginning we know that there are um, there there are balancing that we need to do, and we need to balance um, the measures that are put in place with the impacts that they can have, sometimes positive, but also negative. So we are at a place where we're in the seeing the risk of COVID and mitigating it uh, with measures that are less restrictive so that we can support people in the recovery from what we've been through in this last uh, in this last two years. So we know that there's been dramatic impacts on young people in schools, in uh, post-secondary institutions, on anxiety, on mental health. And so finding this balance is really important. Um, ensuring that we can start focusing on getting back to some of the the things that are really important around connecting, around um, being able to uh, sing together without masks on in a safe environment, and doing that to support people to recover from what we've been through, as well as trying to minimize uh, the transmission of COVID over the next little while. We have time for one more question today. We'll go to Bell Puri, CBC. 
Uh, Dr. Henry, um, you have repeatedly said that, you know, we can't let our guard down because who knows what's coming. So I'm wondering what work is being done right now while the case counts and transmissions are low to uh, prepare for what might be coming in the fall, you know, and especially in our healthcare system and in the education, if we could get an answer in English and French, please. Yeah, you know, I've talked a little bit about um, how we need to manage this as one of the serious respiratory illnesses that's going to be with us for t for some time. And we're still in the place where we're learning about COVID and it's still changing. So we're not yet in that endemic state where we know what to expect. So part of what we're doing is, is focusing on surveillance and integrating it into the things that we do to monitor for other serious respiratory illnesses. We need to focus on on uh, the impact on our health care system. And I know the minister and uh, Deputy uh, Steve Brown have been very seized with how do we build up our health human resources? How do we um, that we have the nurses and physicians and, and have recovered from this pandemic enough to support. What we've learned, we've learned about the importance We've learned at the importance of different tools. We've learned about the importance of ventilation in buildings, both in workplaces, in healthcare, in schools. So uh, those are things that we need to think about. We need to think about uh, how we have better access to testing, better tests, better vaccines, better treatments. So those are all things that we need to focus on and we need to look at as well. How do we support behaviors? We've learned things about um, what it means to wear masks in certain settings and how some people react to that and what some of the downside impacts are. So how do we make that behavior um, supportive and um, empowering for people to protect themselves as we go into another piece of uncertainty? Uh, the other thing I think is really important is some of the things we've learned about um, how to support workers in long-term care and our long-term long care sector that was so fragmented and didn't have uh, you know the single site order so how do we transition that into a supportive positive working environment for people in long-term care how do we uh, the things around sick leave and how that is such an important tool to allow people to take those measures to stay away from others if they're sick themselves so i think there's lots of things that we need to think about about what we've learned from this pandemic to take us through um, next year. And you know, the other thing I'm very passionate about is it, this pandemic, pandemic has exposed some of the inequities in our society. And so how do we use this opportunity to start addressing some of those? And and just to say in English, one of the reasons when we um, first delayed surgeries uh, in the spring of 2020, uh, in that time in the middle of March through to the end of May, we made a commitment to, to catch up, and we did. Uh, more than 99% of those surgeries that were delayed completed, and we ended up in the calendar year that followed it doing more surgeries than we'd done the previous year, in spite of the fact that COVID-19 um, it caused uh, consumed time. The precautions that are required for COVID-19 actually made surgeries longer. We did it by adding hours at the end of days. We did it by adding surgeries on weekends. We did it by 81 measures that were taken across health authorities to increase the number of surgeries and to reduce wait time such that there are fewer people waiting for surgeries today than there were at the beginning of the pandemic. And we have to take those steps in every area. And a critical one is health human resources, making sure that we have the doctors and the nurses, the health sciences professionals, the health care workers we need. And lots of the measures we've taken in the pandemic have had an impact on that. The wage leveling component of the single site initiative, for example, the age cap program that's brought thousands of new workers to long term care, the steps we're taking to expand nursing spaces. All of the steps we're taking, the steps that we continue to do to, to make it easier for internationally educated healthcare workers to come and to, to be in BC and to use uh, their skills to the full extent of their ability. All of these things are important. 
The final thing I wanted to note is that uh, prior to the pandemic, we had seen uh, a decline in overdose deaths in our public health emergency that's the overdose crisis that has so focused our efforts for the last now uh, more than five years. And that continues to be a challenge. We come through the pandemic and some of the actions taken during the pandemic, including the fact that people were spending more time alone, impacted uh, the outcomes of overdoses and led to overdose deaths. And so we have a continuing obligation as a healthcare system and as a society to address both public health emergencies. It continues today. It doesn't stop. We need to be relentless and we will be. And I'll save the print just a second. Okay. <laughs> Bell, do you have a follow up? Uh, I do, and uh, I have to remind the minister to answer the first question in French when he comes up again, please. In the meantime, Dr. Henry, um, when you talked about changes to visitation rules and long-term care, uh, you suggested that it, it won't be immediate. Uh, can you give people who really want to get in there to see their family members uh, a timeline of when they can expect all facilities to come into compliance with the updated rules? Yeah, so we've been talking with the sector over uh, the last couple of days around this. And so it will be by uh, next Friday. So we're giving a week. Um, some people will be, uh, some facilities will be ready tomorrow. Others, it may take a little bit longer to ramp up um, their ability to, to cope with uh, larger numbers of visitors coming in. But the expectation is that it will be by, um, by next Friday, the 18th. Thank you. 